All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's look at verse 20 again. Verse 20, it says, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. So the title for the sermon this morning is Ambassadors for Christ. Now, if you're saved, did you know God considers you his ambassador? When you think about an ambassador, you think of someone from a foreign nation, right? You think of someone who's traveled to another nation, not their own, and are representing their country. They're representing their king. They're representing their government, okay? And Christ looks at you, if you're saved, as a repre representation of himself, a representation of heaven, okay? And so we, we, as we look through this, we're going to understand exactly how are we ambassadors? In what way are we ambassadors? Because in truth, we know that we're fallen human beings. We know we have fragile bodies. We know we have a sinful nature. We know that we seek sin in this flesh. So in what way are we exactly an ambassador for Christ? So let's pick this up from verse number one, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 1. It says, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. So immediately we begin this teaching that we've got two, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, buildings, if you will, for the, for the term. Okay, The first one is the tabernacle. Okay, an earthly house, a tabernacle, that's one, that's one of our buildings, if you will. The other one is a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. So if we have this building in the heavens that God has prepared and will give us one day, that's actually how we are ambassadors. We're representing, in a sense, even though we've not received that uh, heavenly house just yet, but that is what we're representing. That will be our eternal home forever and while we've not been there physically we are still his ambassadors we are still his representation upon the earth now notice that that earthly house now this is talking about our bodies okay if, if i haven't if that's been clear to you okay talking about our house our physical corrupted bodies that we have today the flesh is compared there as an earthly house of this tabernacle now, if you remember what the tabernacle was, that's where the Old Testament saints would come and sacrifice, uh, you know, the sheep and the oxen and the goats. But that was before the temple was constructed. God gave instruction to the um, Israelites to have a, a tabernacle which was mobile, which was able to move from one area to another area. You know, God never asked them to build a, a, a temple, a physical temple. And yet, even though Israel did that, even though God allowed them to do that, we then see that picture as the picture of our bodies. Firstly, we have this tabernacle, which is uh, not permanent. You know, we're going to unfortunately die one day. This body is going to perish one day. It's not going to last forever. That was the idea of the tabernacle. It wasn't going to be in a fixed place forever. It would be carried from place to place. But then when King David organized and then ultimately King Solomon built the temple of God, it was in a fixed location. Even though God himself did not instruct them to do that, he did bless them with the glory of God in that temple. And that temple was that fixed structure. It wasn't going to go anywhere. And so God compares that teaching from the Old Testament, or that story, I guess, if you will, of the Old Testament with our bodies today. The resurrected bodies that we're going to receive in the future is this eternal temple but it's not a temple made by hands it's not something that's earthly it's not something that will perish it's something that God has prepared and it says eternal in the heavens this is a future promise to come but even though it's a future promise to come the reality is true right now that that is who we really are in Christ and that's why we are ambassadors to Jesus Christ verse number two for in this we groan, okay, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. So maybe that makes more sense now when you've understood what verse number one is saying, is that because we're in our fallen nature, because we have this sinful nature, and if you're saved, you have the Spirit of God, and it's warring against the flesh, that old man versus the new man, 
The new man is desiring to have that physical body which will no longer sin. So it, it is no longer in war. It is no longer uh, lusting against the flesh and the flesh lusting against the spirit. Okay? So the new man, the spirit, wants that resurrected body. And even if your body's falling apart, you know, you have illnesses, you have some chronic disease, you're probably also, and maybe you have pain in your bodies, you're also kind of wishing for that new resurrected body as soon as possible, right? To get over this body that you have. And so as believers, we groan or earnestly desire those new bodies which are to come from heaven. You know, I often hear people say, oh, I wish Jesus would just come back right now. You know, and that's the groaning, that's the nature. You know, of someone, I wish Jesus just, I mean, things are getting so bad. I'm suffering so much. There's trials and tribulations. Yeah, that's the groaning that's being pictured here in uh, verse number two. Um, and it, before we get to verse number three, it talks about like being clothed. Okay, it's like the flesh is kind of like a clothing of the soul. And then in verse number three, it says, If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. Okay, so... We're not going to, you know, once the resurrection takes place, we're always going to have that, ta that, sorry, that temple, that physical body available to us. And we're not going to be found naked. Now, I, the reason I believe um, God used the word naked here is because when you first think of nakedness in the Bible, you know, we think of Adam and Eve before they had sinned, they were able to be naked and they were not ashamed about their nakedness. But when they committed sin, all of a sudden, the shame of nakedness came upon them. They understood in the state they were, and they needed. They remember they tried to clothe themselves. They tried to clothe themselves with uh, with uh, um, what was it again? Fig leaves. That's right, with fig leaves, right? But it wasn't sufficient, and so God had to clothe them with skins of an animal. That's kind of the same idea here. You know, those fig leaves were a temporary thing. No, it's not good enough. We need to clothe you properly with, with the, the, the skin of, I believe, was probably a lamb at that stage, representing Jesus Christ. But that's not what the Bible teaches, but I think that's probably the case that it was. And so, you know, when, we're, when we receive our resurrected bodies, when we stand in the presence of God, we're not going to be found naked. We're not going to be ashamed, okay? Because we now have that resurrected body. Yes, we may be ashamed of what we've done in our past life, the sins we've committed. Yes, you know, in a sense, that's the truth. But we're talking about physically standing before God. You know, if God were here right now, you know, in our presence, in His fullness, well, not only would we be totally destroyed in the flesh that we are, but we would be ashamed of God. We wouldn't want Him here in the presence. In the same way when, when our God came walking in the garden, Adam hid himself. Remember, he was ashamed of his nakedness. And in the same way, spiritually, you know, when we stand before God finally and we see Him in His full presence, we will not be ashamed because those old fleshly bodies that we were clothed in will be done away with and we're going to have this perfect resurrected body which is without sin. Verse number four. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed. So it's not like we're, 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 we have this burden to be unclothed. Now, what I believe that's been referred to, it's not like we have this desire to just die. You know, because obviously once we die, we are in a sense unclothed because our soul and spirit leave the body. So it's not, it's not like we're pessimists and, and negative and we're like, oh, I wish I just was dead. You know, that's not how a Christian ought to be. So that's what I believe has been referred here. Uh, but the reason we groan is not because we're groaning to die, but we're, we groan, it says, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. So our groaning is that the mortality, which is that, you know, we are dying, our bodies aren't here forever, that it would eventually be swallowed up by that, that uh, the, the, I guess, the eternal life of the new body to come, the resurrected body to come. Okay? And as I continue preaching through this chapter, you know, you might be thinking, didn't we just cover all this stuff already, Kevin? Weren't we already talking about the resurrected bodies when we were looking at 1 Corinthians 15? And weren't we talking about the uh, rewards in heaven when we looked at, because uh, we're going to look at the rewards soon, you know, uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians, was it 4? 3. 3. 1 Corinthians, yeah, you're right, 3. You know, haven't we covered this already? Yeah, but pay attention. This is the same church receiving the teaching once again from a slightly different angle. Okay, and I don't want us to ever get to a point, I know this is a bit off topic, but I never want us to get to the point where we're thinking, oh, we already heard this teaching. Can't you teach on something new? Yeah, but you know what we see in the Bible? Sometimes God repeats the same things again in a slightly different way because we need to hear it again. We need to be reminded again. I'm, 
I'm often thought, I often think the things that are most often repeated need to be most often repeated behind the pulpit. Okay? Because it's the church that is, uh, are believers, just like us. Okay? And they're made of the same flesh and blood. They need, they need to hear the same repetition that we need to hear. So I just want you to make sure you have that mindset that when we go through chapter by chapter and you're like, well, we just covered this. Well, yeah, you know, then God wants us to cover it again. All right? Otherwise, he wouldn't have uh, ex- uh, taught us that twice in his word. Uh, but let's look at verse number five. Verse number five. Now, he that have wrought, or if, if you're not sure that what that word means, it just means worked. Okay? Now, he that have wrought or worked us for the self-same thing is God, okay, who also have given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. So I think what the self-same thing there that's been referred to are those resurrected bodies. That that's, that's a work of God, okay. You're not being born of your mother to have that resurrected body. It's not an earthly thing made of hands, but it's come from God. That resurrected body also gives glory to God. It's not about glorifying man. It's because, again, we're found in Christ and then we're blessed with that resurrected body to come. To come, but then he says, "Who also have given us the earnest of the Spirit." Okay, so what that's referring to again, I've covered this before, is that even though we don't have those physical resurrected bodies right now, He has given us the Holy Spirit. That's kind of like the down payment, the promise that we are going to have these resurrected bodies. Otherwise, why would He preserve us with the Holy Spirit? Why would He be, allow us to be born of the Spirit and have this new life if we were never going to receive these resurrected bodies? So it's, just, it's the promise that we have today of the Spirit, which is why we know we're going to receive that self-same thing, that resurrected body uh, given to us by God. Verse number 6. Therefore we are always confident. Remember, we got that down payment of the Holy Spirit. So Paul says that's why we're confident about this thing. I mean, do you ever have doubts about heaven? Do you ever have doubts that you're going to receive these beautiful resurrected bodies to come? You know, sometimes we might, right? Because we don't, you know, physically see these things. We've never seen, we haven't seen a resurrected Jesus in our fleshly eyes. But we've seen him in faith because we believe what the Word of God says. And we can be as confident about anything that we find in the Bible. You know, we can be more confident about what we read in the Bible if we accept it by faith than what people see with their own fleshly eyes. You know, I'm reminded of people that saw Jesus Christ when he was upon this earth. They saw him do these amazing miracles. They saw him raise, you know, Lazarus from the dead. And what? Did they believe on him? Many of them did not believe on him. Okay. And yet we can have a greater confidence just by reading his word because his word is life and it's spiritual and it gives us faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Okay. So we have confidence and I hope you have confidence that that, that day is going to come. You know, you're not going to suffer forever. You're going to have those resurrected bodies. Therefore, we are always confident, verse number six, knowing that whilst we are at, at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. Well, what does that mean? Are we absent from the Lord? Well, in a sense, we are absent from the Lord. Okay. Now, in a general spiritual sense, of course, we're not absent from the Lord. He said he'll never forsake us. Okay. The Holy Spirit is indwelling in us. We have God in us. Okay, we have the kingdom of God in us. We are in his kingdom. The reality is that we do have God. Okay? But if we understand what we've just been reading about these physical bodies, currently, physically, we are not in the presence of God. Okay? Because again, if, if God were right here in his full presence, we would be utterly destroyed just by the light of his glory. Okay? So in a sense, yes, we are absent from the Lord while we're in these physical bodies. That's why the Bible says flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God in this current state that we're in. Okay. Uh, look at verse number seven. For we walk by faith, not by sight. And it's just pretty much what I just, I don't want to repeat that again. But again, the confidence that we have is because we walk in faith. Okay. It's not the physical sight that we're so concerned about. You know, and uh, you know, salvation is by faith, right? You, you know you're saved because the Holy Spirit testifies to your spirit, your eternal salvation, that your salvation took place. But I can't look at you physically and see the new man. I can't see what's inside of you. I can't see your soul. I can't see your spirit, right? That's why we walk by faith and not by sight. So many people want to judge someone's salvation by their sight. 
They're looking at him and go, well, are they living a Christian life? Are they doing enough works? Are they going to church? Are they doing Bible reading? Then I'll judge if they're saved. No, you can't. We walk by faith, right? You know, we, we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and then we live by faith. You know, we walk by faith in all that we do, okay? And not by sight. You know, I, I, on Sunday I went soul winning with, in Sydney and uh, knocked on the atheist door and he said to me, you know what, if Jesus Christ came and did a miracle in front of my eyes, then I would believe. Okay, but then I just repeated to him what I said to you before, that Jesus Christ did come, did do many miracles, and many did not believe. Because he's trusting his sight, he's trusting his uh, 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 limited uh, knowledge and limited wisdom that he has as a man, rather than putting all his faith on Jesus Christ alone. Verse number eight, we are confident, I say. It's like he has to repeat it twice. You know, maybe there were some doubts in this church. Are we really? And we know, because if we looked at 1 Corinthians, we knew that there were some that, w- that weren't sure about the resurrection. They, they didn't think there'd be a resurrected body. So maybe this is why he's repeating that again. He says, we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So it's much better to be with the Lord, right? He would, he's, will, he's more willing to be absent of this, of this physical body and present with the Lord. But again, keep in mind what we've read before. It's not like we have this desire to just die. You know, you know this is not a cult. I'm not going to start serving you Kool-Aid with, uh, what, I don't know, what, what poison was it? Arsenic. Arsenic. I'm not going to start, I go, well, you know, we're going to die. Let's look forward to death. You know, no, that's not, you know, we have a life here to live. You know, God can give us fullness of life right now. He has a purpose for us. We know what that purpose is if you're here on Friday, and that's to win souls. And we'll see that again in this chapter. You know, it's important to understand this. And so, but yeah, you know, we ought to be more willing to be with the Lord. You know, so when we do die, when our loved ones pass away and we know they're in Christ, they're saved, we can rejoice because they're in the presence of the Lord. Yes, there's mourning. Yes, there's sadness. But at the same time, there's great joy because we know that person is no longer suffering and they're uh, rejoicing in the presence of the Lord. Verse number nine, wherefore we labor. What does it mean to labor to work? Okay, wherefore we labor, whether present or absent. Remember, this is being dead or alive, whether one or the other, we may be accepted of him. So we as Christians ought to have a desire to be accepted by God. Now, um, first of all, when it says uh, whether present or absent, let's talk about the absence for a minute. Again, if we're absent, it means we've passed on, right? We've, we've died and now we're in the presence of God. So if you're a believer and you pass away, by default, because you have the new man and that new man has gone to heaven, the soul and spirit are in heaven, you are accepted of him, okay? Because your position before God is righteous, okay? But then he also says we labor with a presence to be accepted of him. So when we're present on this earth in our fleshly bodies, he says, I work, right, to be accepted of God. I labor, okay? So, you know, when I talk about, you know, um, we talk about rightly dividing the word of God, okay? That's a common statement. And I've I've explained to you about the differences between the old man and the new man. That's something we need to understand, right? But something that's very closely related to that is another division that you need to understand in the Bible. And that's... uh, uh, your position before God and your walk with God. Okay? Your position before God is acceptable. It's perfect because of what Jesus Christ has done. Okay? And that's your salvation. There's nothing you can do to make yourself acceptable to God in your position because you're in Christ. Christ has done all the work. Okay? We just believe on Him, His death, burial, and resurrection, and positionally before God, we're accepted of Him. But then our daily walk of our life, because we have the flesh, because we sin, because we fail, because we struggle, because we doubt, you know, that walk may not be acceptable of God. And so Paul is saying, hey, I labor to be acceptable, whether absent or present. You know, he makes sure it's his desire to always strive to be accepted by God. And so even though salvation is by faith and not of your works, and that's true, 
But once we're saved, we ought to work, we ought to labor and desire to be acceptable to God in our daily life. Okay? So that's something you need to really understand when rightly dividing the Word of God. When you're reading these passages, not only the old man and the new man, but your uh, position before God and your walk before God. Okay? Um, and, uh, you know, one way, and, I've, I've, and I keep striving this because I feel like this is not preached enough. You need to confess your sins on a regular basis. I would say daily, because you sin daily, right? Just, just confess your sins daily, because that's what's going to keep you in that right relationship with God. You've got to humble yourself. Yes, try to overcome the sins, but understand that you're never going to overcome sins in your life, at least while we're in, this, uh, uh, in, in these bodies. But that's why we need to confess these sins, not for salvation, but just to maintain a right relationship and be acceptable in the sight of God. In our walk, okay, not in our position. Our position is settled in Christ. Verse number 10. For, so we talked about the labor in, the work in, in, the, you know, in our walk. For, so this is a conjunction in relation to that. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Okay, we're all going to be judged by Christ at his judgment seat. Saved people will be judged at the judgment seat of Christ and the unsaved at the great white throne judgment where their names are not going to be found in the book of life and will be cast into eternal, the eternal lake of fire. That's a sad thing for the unbeliever. But the believer still gets a judgment. Okay, but not a judgment of your sins because your sins were judged on the cross. Your sins were judged and, and taken upon Jesus Christ in his body. So that's been done away with. But here we're going to be judged. It says, uh, look, look at this, what it says here, that everyone may receive the things done in his body. Not the sins, but the laboring that we did, right? For him, according to that he have done, whether it be good or bad. So when, we, when, we, when, we, when the Lord comes back and resurrects us, gives us those resurrected bodies, he's going to judge us on the things we've done in our body. Not the sins, but the works we've done. Okay, the works that we've done, whether they be good or bad. It doesn't say whether they be good or sinful. Okay, so um, to understand this then, obviously, and this is the whole point of this, this passage, talking about the eternal bodies that we ought to have, comparing eternity to the temporal things that we have. You know, the previous chapter covers this as well. But uh, there are works that you can do in this life that have eternal value. If you serve the Lord, you serve the brethren, okay? Because Jesus says if you, if you serve one another, it's like you're serving Him. Whatever you do that has eternal value are the things that are found good in your body because they're good in the sight of eternity. And the Lord Jesus Christ will come and reward you for the works that you've done for His name, okay? And for His church and for the work He's left us to do upon this earth. But then there are other things that we all do. There are plenty of things that we do that are, that are bad, meaning that there are no, there's no eternal value. Okay, but they're not sinful in and of themselves. You know, the hobbies that you have, the, you know, the things that you do to blow off a bit of steam or, you know, uh, sporting, whatever, you know, I don't, I don't know what people like to do. Just the things that you do in your life that adds no value to eternal things. Those are the things that are considered bad. Okay, but they're not wrong or sinful. It's just, it doesn't, doesn't hold eternal value. And so we ought to just have that in mind that let's not just live a life for ourselves, even though we're not necessarily sinful, wicked people, but we strive to also have a place in our lives that has things that are eternal value. You know, that's why soul winning is such a great thing. It's probably the greatest thing that you can do to receive those rewards. Okay, I also believe the way you live your life and just, just the fellowship and the service you have for one another as brethren, of course. You know, Jesus Christ says, even if you give a cup of water to a child in my name, that you won't lose your reward. Okay, so there's reward even in serving one another a cup of water. Okay, but we need to make sure we have a balance in our life and that we strive to have works that are good and eternal. Verse number 11. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. So he wants to persuade us to do the works. He wants to persuade us to have eyes for eternal things and not just be mindful of the temporary. Okay, because there, there is a fear of the Lord. You know, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. It's the beginning of wisdom. It's the start of all things. 
It's the fear of God that gets you saved because you realize just how much God hates sin and how God's going to judge sin and you're deserving of hell because of what you've done. It's the fear of God that starts everything. And so uh, uh, Paul is here reminding the church, hey, you need to have a fear of the Lord. Maybe you've lost some of that fear because that's what's going to drive you, not just to get saved, but that's what's going to drive you to do the great works because you want to be presentable to God, be acceptable. Hey, Lord, look in my life, here are the things that I've done for you. You know, that's, uh, otherwise it's a little bit embarrassing if you come before the Lord and you've got nothing there. You're still saved. Okay, even if you did no works, you're still saved. But it's a little bit embar- it'd be a little bit embarrassing, right? Knowing that how much God has done for you and you've not given anything back uh, for his kingdom. Uh, but it says here, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God. So we're going to, our works will be revealed to God. But then it says, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciousness. Consciences. Consciences. So not only are my works manifest to God on that judgment day, but my works have also been manifest to the church here in, you know, in Corinth or the church here in Caloundra, if you will. Okay, we, the works, you know, so uh, Paul is basically saying, uh, proving that the works that he's done has been uh, something of eternal value and something that has given joy to the church, has, has uh, profited the church. Because again, the false prophets will come. They don't look to profit the church. They simply come to look at profiting themselves. What can I get out of the church rather than what can I give to the church? Uh, Let's look at verse number 12. For we commend not ourselves again to you. So I'm not coming to, uh, 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 what's the word I'm thinking of? Uh, Quantify or qualify myself before you again. You know, he's already their apostle. He's already gotten so many of these people saved. He's already established his church. He says, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf. So the reason why I've told you about all the works we've done is so you can glory in them. I mean, I know we don't all go soul winning, but when you hear about the news of someone getting saved, like we know today, isn't that something that we can glory in as a church, as a whole? You know, when, 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 when there are people, believers that we love, churches that we love, and they do great works, even though we didn't do those works ourselves, we can glory in those things, right? We can rejoice in those works. You know, uh, right now, we, we, we're not, we're not uh, giving any money to a missionary. At some, day, some point, I would hope to be able to support a missionary. And then when we hear reports back from the work that they've done, the souls that were, that were saved, even though we did not do it, we, could, we can glory in that and know, hey, we, 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 we played a part somehow to help this person go out and do the works. Okay? And so that's why, again, Paul is not praising himself. He's not trying to boast of himself. He's just saying, hey, the works that we've done, you can glory in. You know, he's trying to encourage this church. What verse am I up to? 12? Oh, yeah that ye may have somewhat to answer them, which glory in appearance and not in heart. So there are some people, I don't know whether within the church or people that are critical of the church, that glory in appearance, on the outward appearance, rather than in the heart. You know, uh, the, the, um, they're not sincere, they're not genuine people, right? They, they glory about themselves. You know, um, this is the respecter of, of men. You know, so many people respect uh, hold, hold men in high degree who aren't doing any, anything of eternal value for God, you know, are simply there to promote themselves. And Paul compares them to himself, who is suffering, who is going without food, who is get, you know, near the points of death, but his works are something they can glory in. And they shouldn't glory with people that glory after the appearance. Okay. Verse 13. For whether we be beside ourselves... Now, this is a a figure of speech. We still use that a little bit when people say, you're beside yourself. What are we saying? When we're saying, you know, you're beside yourself, we're saying like, you're you're a bit mentally unhinged. You're you're a bit, uh, you're a bit crazy, you know? And so, you know, Paul uses this kind of terminology. So he says, whether we be beside ourselves. Now, remember, remember what he's gone through. Remember what he's suffered, right? (laughs) This guy's gone through shipwreck. This guy's been uh, stoned to death and was brought back. I mean, this guy suffered a lot of things in his life. And to the natural man, that would seem crazy. 
Why are you doing that? I mean, people think we're crazy for being in church this morning. People think we're crazy that we're, you know, I'm sure people are walking past and thinking, this is crazy. They listen to a man yell, you know, in, in, in front of a lake, but we're not even suffering. We're just sitting here enjoying the sun, right? But what if you were suffering, being persecuted, and you're still doing it for the name of, of Christ? You know, people think you're crazy. But he says, whether we be beside, not that he's crazy, but if that's the, the perception that exists, it is to God, he says. We don't do it for ourselves. We do it to glorify God. Or whether we be sober, being of sound mind, okay, it is for your cause. So when we do things that seem sound and profitable, hey, it's for your cause. You look good. You look good because uh, you're, you're supporting us. You're praying for us. Okay, but if, if we look crazy, you know, it's to God. You know, you, you don't need to, you know, be seen in a bad light for that. But we're doing it unto God. God knows our hearts. God knows we're serving Him. But when everything's going well, hey, it's, it's good for you. It's good for you as a church. You, you benefit from Paul's example. Verse 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge... And if one die for all, then we're all dead. So the love of Christ here, which is exemplified through the death that he had on the cross for us, he says that's what drives him. Yes, the rewards. Yes, knowing that he's going to receive a physical body. Yes, knowing that he's going to be with the Lord forever in eternity. But also the love of Christ is what drives him. To serve the Lord. And I think we need to have a little bit of that in us as well. We need to say, hey, God loved us so much. He sent His only begotten Son to suffer such a cruel death in the physical uh, way, you know, that we think of the shedding of blood and the crucifixion, but also spiritually having taken upon all our sins, the sins of the whole world, the sins of the worst serial killers, the sins of every abortion, the sins of every, everything that you can think of that's wicked in this world were put on Christ and that love that He has for us is what's driving Him. Say, I love you, I love you too, Lord. We love you because you first loved us and I'm going to seek to serve you with my life. We ought to have that desire in us, right? But that love comes from God and we reflect, reflect that love back to Him or back to the brethren or back to this lost and dying world as we seek to see them saved. Uh, verse 15, And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. So we should live unto Christ. We should seek to serve him. We should seek to walk in his steps. We should seek to keep his commandments. Okay, but again, keep in mind, this is not for salvation. These are things that we should do because we're saved. Okay, but these are not things that we must do to be saved. What we must do to be saved is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and trust His salvation, trust His work that He's paid for our sins and that we're not trusting in a church or trusting in our own works. But we should, once saved, yes, there is a... There should be an expectation that you're going to serve and love Him and try to serve and keep His commandments. But keep those things separate. I spoke to you about rightly dividing the Word of God. You know, salvation is by faith. Don't forget that. That's what we teach. If you want to get someone saved, you must understand, they must understand that it's by faith and not of works. But then when you're saved, do the works! You know, we need to do more works, <laughs> you know. Um, people think that we, we, we don't want to do the works because we say salvation is by faith. No, that's the, be that's, that's the great part. But then to earn the rewards in heaven, the judgment seat of Christ, do the works so we, we'll be acceptable to, to Him in our walk, okay? Verse 16. Oh, did I read verse 16? I read it? No, okay, <laughs> thanks. Wherefore, henceforth... Know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth we know him no more. I was struggling to work this out. If you guys have some ideas, well, I'm going to go to Sydney straight after this, but you can tell me later on. But I'll give you what I think this is saying, okay? Um, 
so, so we know no man after the flesh. So it's, it's like, because we have the flesh and the spirit, you know, um, Paul is trying to have the eyes of eternity. He's not trying to see this life in his fleshly desire. It's like, so he doesn't, he's not trying to live or see after the flesh. But then he says, Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, so it's in the flesh, in your unsaved state, that you first know of Christ. A lot of people that are unsaved know of Christ. They know Him uh, after the flesh, but they don't know Him in the Spirit. So once you are saved and you're revived in that Spirit, this is what I believe He says at the end of it, Yet now henceforth know we Him no more. So we don't know Christ anymore in the flesh, but we know Him in the Spirit, which is why we can fellowship and grow and, and, uh, and uh, be nurtured in God by the Spirit. That's what I think that verse is saying. It's a little bit tricky. If you've got some other ideas, please let me know. Verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Again, I forgot the memory verse. Anyway, this is the memory verse. Okay. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And this verse is so straightforward to me and yet so many people misapply it because they want to have a false gospel because they want to teach works because they want to teach you you must repent from your sins and keep the laws of God in order to be saved they take a passage like this and say well to be saved you must be this new creature what they teach is reformation of your life okay they say well see old things are passed away all things have become new. And if you're not walking after this newness, then you must not even be saved. They say if your life has not changed in the outward appearance, then you're not even saved. And so what they're saying is, you must do the works and keep the commands to be saved. Because otherwise you're not the new creature. But is this flesh, this, we, we read, what did we read about? This flesh is going to be done away with. It's not forever. This flesh is not of God, it's of Adam. Okay, it's, it's a sinful nature. You, can't, you won't find a new creature in this flesh. Okay, what is a new creature? It says there in verse 17, If any man be in Christ, it's the new man in, that's in Christ. It's the spirit, it's the soul that's saved that's in Christ. It's that new man, that new life, that new creature that is, that is new, that is brand new. And the old things are passed away because that old man cannot be tainted by those old things. Okay, it says all things are become new. All things. So if you think salvation is reformation, reforming your life, and yet you commit a sin tomorrow, even if it's a tiny little white lie, then you can't say all things are become new because you've just sinned. But in the new man, because he doesn't sin, all things are become new. It's perfect because it's in Christ. This flesh is not in Christ, but that future resurrected body to come will also be in Christ because it, it will be likened unto Christ and His resurrection. Verse 18, And all things are of God, who have reconciled us to Himself by Jesus Christ. Now pay attention to this. Why did God give us this new creature? Why is God promising us this future resurrected body? Is it just so we can, you know, just praise God and not really have any influence in our community? No. You know, it says, And all things are of God who have reconciled us to Himself by Jesus Christ and have given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Look, we're ambassadors of God. Okay, it's not just a title. It's a work, right? The ambassador is there in a, in a nation to have good relations with the foreign nation, right? To, to build, uh, you know, agreements, to uh, have, you know, um, agree in trade or agree in financial uh, decisions and, and make sure whatever decisions one nation makes is also in the best interest of their own nation. And so we as ambassadors of Christ have been given us this uh, ministry of reconciliation because we're representing heaven. We come here to, we're, we're, well, we come, we're, we're on this earth already, to, to uh, build that relationship
between uh, the unsaved and God himself through the reconciliation of salvation found in Jesus Christ by grace through faith. And verse 19, to wit or to witness, to speak of, okay, that God was in Christ. You know, thankfully we live in a nation that we don't need to really uh, emphasize this too much because most people do recognize, you know, uh, that Jesus Christ is God. You know, but we do need to make sure that when we're preaching the gospel, that we teach them that Jesus Christ is God. Okay? God in the flesh. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and have committed unto us the word of reconciliation. So how do we reconcile people to God? By... Can I, I'll use your illustration last time by uh, the puppet show, <laughs> you know, by uh, uh, living a very righteous life. Is that how we do the reconciliation? You know, will people look at our life and go, wow, you, you're such a Christian. What must I do to be saved? No, that's not what happens, right? It says the word of reconciliation, meaning you need to speak words. <laughs> you know, you need to open up the scriptures and proclaim boldly. Uh, the gospel to this lost and dying world. It's by word. It's not by any other way. God has caused salvation to be through someone expressing the word of God to another. And I love how it says there in verse 19, and have committed unto us the word of reconciliation. What does it mean to commit something? It means you've entrusted someone with that. You know, God has entrusted you. God trusts you to do his work. And are you doing it? You know, when you think of your own life, did God rightly put his trust in me? Am I going about and carrying out this work that he left us to do? God has entrusted you. God has committed this to you. Okay, verse number 20. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Again, just the fact that we are his representation on this earth. People think of the Pope, the Roman Catholic Pope. He's the, supposed to be the, the you know, representation of Christ, or maybe even Christ himself on this earth kind of thing. No, that's not. It's us. You know, we're the representation of God. We represent God. We represent the kingdom of God. We are to represent Christ in our life. So be mindful of that as ambassadors that the way you live your life represents heaven. Be mindful of how you behave, not just in church, but in your day-to-day -day life. Be mindful about what you do on social media, you know, because it represents the kingdom of God. And in some ways it represents our church. You know, if you, if you make a fool of yourself on social media and people know, hey, this, is a, this person goes to New Life Baptist Church, it's going to reflect badly on all of us. You know, it's not just you. It's not just, hey, well, I'm just this way I am. You know, people have to take it or leave it. Hey, you represent more people than yourself. You represent your family. You represent your church. And you represent the kingdom of God. He's made you his ambassador for a reason. Okay? Don't be this lone ranger thinking that your actions don't affect anybody else. They at least affect God. Okay? Verse number 21. And we're wrapping up now. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, Jesus Christ, perfection. He had no sin. He had the temptations because he was fully man as well. But he did not give in to those temptations. He lived a perfect... How hard is it to not sin? How hard? It's hard, right? It's difficult. You know, can you... I don't know if you can even go a day without sinning. I don't know. Maybe some have. I don't know. But I don't think you can go two days without sinning, right? This was a challenge of Jesus Christ. Yes, he was God, but at the same time, he was man. And he was able to live a life of 30 more year, plus years without sin, very difficult day by day for us. So he could be our sacrifice, who knew no sin. But he was made sin for us. He took on all our sin. I can't believe that. I can't believe that God himself who's perfect and pure and righteous, would allow himself, the Son of God, to take on the sins of the whole world. Exactly what God hates and, and die for us and, and suffer 
the consequences of all that. But why? That we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. That beautiful transaction. We've given Him all our sins. And Christ kept the law perfectly, gives us His righteousness. His imputed righteousness on us so we can stand positionally, you know, acceptable to God. You know, and, and that's the beautiful gift of salvation. Our sins are gone and the righteousness of Christ is imputed, imputed upon us. God sees us as perfect through that veil of Jesus Christ. Okay, let's pray.